Good morning, everybody. Race has been a fundamental issue for Singapore from the very beginning of our nationhood. In 1965, on the day we became independent, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, Singapore is not a Malay nation, not a Chinese nation, not an Indian nation. Everybody will have a place in Singapore. And he said this to assure minorities in Singapore that they would always be protected and not be treated worse than the majority. But he also said this to remind the Chinese majority never to oppress the non-Chinese as they themselves had felt squatted upon when Singapore was in Malaysia. So it was a two-part message, reassuring the minorities, but at the same time, a sober reminder to the majority, please do not overstep yourself. Please do not make life miserable for those who are not quite the same color as you. Why was this principle so important to us? And there are two parts to this answer. First, this was the fundamental ideal over which we fought with the central government in Malaysia and separated from Malaysia. Our founding fathers, Lee Kuan Yew, Go Keng Sui, Rajaratnam, Osman Wok, they believed passionately in the vision of a multiracial society where nobody would be favored, nobody would be disadvantaged because of the color of his or her skin where everybody had equal opportunities and felt kinship and brotherhood with people of different races and religions, but the same Singapore nationality. Malaysia was different. The UMNO leaders in KL, the federal government, the central government, they wanted one dominant race, Malay Malaysians, enjoy special rights and the Chinese the Indians and the other citizens, forever you are in a subordinate position. We fought that. We disagreed with them. It could not be settled. Eventually, we broke because of that. So that was the founding principle. But the second reason for us to make a fundamental point of multiracialism is because Singapore is a Chinese-majority country in a Malay-majority Southeast Asia. Singapore was already perceived then, 1960s, 50 years ago, as a third China, meaning a Chinese country, a proxy, a stooge for communist China, not an independent player. At that time, not even an independent country. So we had to make quite sure that people understood we were Singapore. So for Singapore to be identified as a Chinese country, I think would have caused a lot of problems with our neighbors, we would not be able to live peacefully in Southeast Asia. And therefore, our founding fathers enshrined multiracialism as the fundamental principle on which Singapore was founded and enshrined in our constitution. And drafted the National Pledge, where we pledge ourselves as one united people, regardless of race, language, or religion. In Southeast Asia, race and religion doesn't only affect society and politics, but also terrorism and violence. It's afflicted many countries in Southeast Asia. Hundreds of Indonesians and Malaysians have gone to join ISIS. A few have gone to South Philippines. Hundreds have gone to the Middle East. And there are some very prominent Malaysians and Indonesian terrorists who are with ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Barum Naim, Barun Naim, Barum Shah. There was another one, Mohammed Safran, I think, who was killed recently. That was Malaysian. They are in the Middle East, but they are in full contact with their people back in Indonesia and Malaysia. They use Facebook. Their Facebook is more powerful than mine. They use Telegram, definitely more powerful than mine. They they spread propaganda, they cultivate, they recruit, they give orders, they mount operations. And they tell their sympathizers, come to the Middle East, if you can't do that, go to the Philippines. 
Or you can't do that, do jihad in your own countries. So we are in the middle of this. We are not insulated from this either. Every month or two, ISD picks up one or two people who, has self, who have self-radicalized. In Singaporeans, they are not down and out. They are not uh, from the Middle East. They are born here. They are grown up here. They are educated in schools here, state schools. And something has gone wrong with them, and they have become self-radicalized. Some men... Even some young women, they want to join the militants in Syria. They want to do something violent in Singapore. So it's not a question of if, but when a terrorist attack happens in Singapore, which is why today when we are gathered here, when you came in, you saw all sorts of fortifications and precautions around the UNCC. It's necessary. It's part of life now. It's inconvenient to the residents. There's a lot of work. But we have to take this very seriously, and we have to fortify ourselves, not just physically, but also as a society, psychologically, emotionally, as a people. And that means we need multiracialism. Multiracialism will not stop an attack. It can still happen, because multiracialism, if I get 99.99% of Singaporeans multiracial, I will still have a handful who will not believe in this and may go wrong. But multiracialism will help me deal with the day after, the morning after, after a terrible attack has happened, when people are in shock, in pain, angry, fearful, and it's very easy to divide between Muslims and non-Muslims and be split as a society. Everybody will be scared. Many people will be angry. It will be big trouble. But if you are strongly, if you've been working at this, you have the IRCCs, you have SG Secure, you have all our neighborhood groups working, we have all our religious leaders together, we work together, we have symbols of the country which are multiracial, then we can hold together, life goes on as one people. That's why I recently held closed-door briefings for first Muslim religious and community leaders, and then for a mixed group, again, closed door, in order to brief them, make sure they know how important and how urgent this problem is, get them on our side to help us to deal with this. And they responded positively, and I think we will have their full cooperation in working towards multiracial unity. So if we look back over the last 52 years since independence, we've made significant progress, becoming one people, regardless of race, language, or religion. We take pride in our country, in our identity. We've worked together, we've built together, we've mourned together, we celebrate together as one people. But you must remember that what we have here is not something natural, something which happened by itself, something which will stay there by itself, but something which is a result of very hard work, a lot of toil and sweat, and gradual education, gradual bringing of people together, gradual inculcation of the values, the attitudes, the confidence and trust, and mutual respect to make us one people. We brought people together. We consciously created common spaces and opportunities. We use English as our common working language while ensuring a place for our mother tongues. We mix all the races together in HDB estates, so there are no enclaves, no ghettos in Singapore. In schools, we recite the pledge every day. We created GRCs, so that in Parliament, we will always have minorities represented. We came down on extremists, hard, regardless whether they were Chinese chauvinists, whether they were Malay extremists, whether they were Indian or Hindu extremists, we came down on them hard. You have to understand this is what Singapore is. This is how Singapore works when they stirred up sentiments against others. Sometimes we think we've arrived. It looks fine. We can do away with all these provisions and rules. It's such a burden. But in fact, it's the other way around. It's because we made these provisions and rules, that's why we've achieved racial and religious harmony. 
and we've not reached an ideal state. Accepting people of a different race, building that confidence, yes, we've made progress, but it's work in progress. Last year, IPS, the Institute of Policy Studies, did a survey. They asked people what they thought about someone working with, being with someone of a different race. So they asked step by step. First, are you okay with somebody of a different race being your colleague? No problem. Are you okay with somebody of a different race being your business partner? Well, have to think a bit more carefully. Are you okay with somebody of a different race becoming your daughter-in-law? Ah, oh, that very difficult. It's a reality. So we, we, we know we are friends, we are citizens together, but there are different circles of trust, and one of the circles is the same religion, the same race. So if you ask, are you okay with somebody of a different race being president? Then the answer is, and they did this survey, this is a different survey done by CNA, IPS together with CNA. Then the answer is, well, I have to be more careful than having my colleague at the next desk work with me, but it's a bit easier than having a son-in-law or daughter-in-law. And I think that is an honest answer. It is not this is, you're not completely colorblind. It makes a difference. It will influence your thinking and your choice, either consciously or unconsciously. It's, you're prepared to consider it, but there is a hurdle there, and therefore, it's harder for a minority, a Malay or an Indian or a Eurasian, to stand for election for president in an open election than it is for a Chinese. And I tell you this like this, I think you can accept it. When we make the argument and people get worked up about reserve elections, then they wish it were not true. But I just give you one fact. This time we have a reserve election. We have three candidates, right? Actually, well, three Malay candidates who came forward, of whom two, one, two didn't qualify, but anyway, they came forward. But you look at 2011 presidential election. Hotly contested. A lot of people thought government needs to be checked. All sorts of people came forward. Was there a Malay candidate? Where was the Farid Khans and the uh, Saleh Marikans? Why didn't they come? It didn't cross their minds? No. Why didn't they come? Because they knew in an open election, all things being equal, a non-Chinese candidate got no chance. So, it was, you got Tan Kin Lian, you got Tan Cheng Bok, you got Tan Ji Se, but you don't have a Mari Khan, you don't have a Khan, and you don't have any other Malay candidates. It's a reality. We have to know this, we have to manage this. From time, these are big trends, elections only happen once in a while, but day to day, we have racial issues which we have to deal with. Minorities looking for jobs sometimes face discrimination. Trying to rent or buy a house, sometimes the landlord doesn't want you. And they will give some reason, but you really know they prefer to look for some attendant who's a different race. And they will say, well, it's because of the curry cooking or whatever it is. But actually, it's a racial thing. It does exist. And the stereotypes persist in our daily life too. In conversations, in jokes, if you're amongst close friends, it's okay. Not so close friends, it can cause misunderstanding. We have graffiti. Recently, there was a hoarding, construction hoarding. They put up a decoration, a young Malay girl's picture, and somebody went around and penciled down there, terrorists. The Malay girl was wearing a tudong. So these are realities which we have to manage. The Chinese in Singapore may not realize this because the Chinese in Singapore, you are the majority race, you are not the targets. You may think that Singapore has arrived. And you only get small gentle reminders from time to time when you go to a different country and then you encounter racism. You go to America or Australia or even or somewhere in Europe 
and they look at you askance, and you know what it feels like to be treated as a minority. Younger ones, we've only known peace and, peace and harmony, and it's very easy to believe that race doesn't matter anymore. But it is not so. We have to know our blind spots. We have to make a special effort to make the minority communities feel welcome, feel valued in Singapore. And the majorities, the Chinese community particularly, must make a special effort to make the minorities feel welcome in Singapore. And that's why we amended the Constitution to make it possible for minorities to have a chance to be the president in order to strengthen our multiracial country. Just having a multiracial president will not by itself make Singapore a multiracial country, but it is one important symbol of what Singapore stands for. It's a declaration of what we aspire to be and we are becoming a multiracial society. And it's a reminder to every citizen, especially the Chinese majority, that there's a role for every community in Singapore. We've not had a Malay president since our very first president, Yusuf Ishak, more than 50 years ago. But I'm very happy that we now have Halima Yaakob as our president. And as TPMTO said, when we were attending her installation and swearing in, and singing Majula Singapura, it's a special feeling. We've spent nearly two years preparing to make this move, ever since I opened the subject when we opened Parliament in January 2016. And we've been de debating it in public continually since then, but it's only now that people are seized with it because we've had a reserve election, and particularly only one candidate qualified, so people are worked up, so they are focused. And there's some unhappiness. I, I can feel that. You, you don't have to tell me that. There is some unhappiness. People think that we may be going backwards towards racial politics. But actually, the reality is the opposite. We are making necessary changes to strengthen our multiracial system, in order to progress as one united people. If we did nothing, very likely we won't have a Malay president for a very long time. And after a while, the minorities will start to feel left out, and quite understand, understandably so. And the Chinese majority may become less sensitive to the other races, and it would weaken our sense of shared nationhood for all Singaporeans. We created this elected president system 25 years ago. 1991 came into effect. We knew this would be a problem. In fact, Malay Singaporeans at the time immediately sensed this, that it would be difficult to have a Malay president in future. But at the time, we had to address more pressing issues, how to find good candidates to be president at all. So we said, leave this be, let's watch it and see how things develop. Now. After 25 years, I think it is time. We know how things have developed. We know how things are likely to be for quite a long time to come. I think we know what we need to do in order to mend this problem. And we should not be shy to acknowledge in Singapore that the majority is making a special effort to ensure that the minorities enjoy full and equal treatment. We are not unique as a country in making special arrangements for our head of state. It's necessary in many multiracial countries. And they make deliberate arrangements. Either they have constitutional rules or they have conventions, but they make special arrangements and they arrange for some kind of rotation or special representation for the minorities. You look at Canada, their, their president or their, their governor general, is alternately English-speaking, French-speaking, English-speaking, French-speaking. Currently, they have English-speaking, I think it's a lady from Hong Kong, but she counts as English-speaking. New Zealand, they have minorities. They've had an Indian governor general, Indian descent, I think he came from Fiji. Current governor general it has Maori blood, 
He was a chief of staff, very distinguished soldier. Not by chance and randomly it happened. They specifically look for these people to be the head of state. Switzerland, ideal country, right? 900 years of nationhood. They've got German, Swiss Germans, Swiss French, Swiss Italians, and their president rotates between these three because if they just had an election, the Swiss Germans will win every time. So we have to make that arrangement. When we first had Yusuf Ishak as president, how did it happen? It wasn't an election, it was a choice. How was a choice made? Lee Kuan Yew looked for somebody. And he specifically looked for a distinguished Malay. Why? Because he wanted to show Singaporeans and to show the Federation of Malaya that we can work with the Malays, we are part of Malaya, and we are one Malayan society, we are not a Chinese society. So he looked, hunted, he found Yusuf Ishak. Yusuf Ishak agreed, became our first Yang Di Pertuan Negara, later became our president. Sorry, he's our second Yang Di Pertuan Negara. But became our first president. That's how you choose. So now I'm choosing presidents, I must choose by election, but I need to make the election mechanism such that the Malays have a chance to come in. How do I do that? Well, we had a constitutional commission. They recommended a hiatus-based mechanism with reserve elections, which means if long time no Malay, next election reserve for Malay. Long time no Indian, next election reserve for Indian. In fact, for good measure, they said, long time no Chinese, next election reserved for Chinese. Actually, no need. But the Chinese, I think, all felt if you didn't make provision for Chinese, something not right in, under the sun. So we did it, but it shows you how sensitive this is. It shows you how necessary this is to have a president who is regularly non-Chinese, and to have a mechanism which will achieve this. And for us, it has to be an election mechanism, so it has to be a constrained election. I restrict who can participate, and within that, we choose. If there's a contest, if there's no contest, I ho hope somebody turns up who qualifies and will make a good president. Did I know that this is going to be a difficult subject? That it can be unpopular, it can cost us votes? Yes, of course. Otherwise, I can't be in politics if we don't know that these are sensitive matters. But I did it because I strongly believed and still do that this is the right thing to do. There's nothing natural about where we are. Multiracial, multireligious, tolerant, and progressive. We made it happen. We've got to protect it, nurture it, preserve it, and never, never break it. At her swearing-in, President Halima said she can understand why people didn't like a reserved election. And like them, she looks forward to the day when we no longer lead it, need it, and Singaporeans naturally and regularly elect citizens of all races as presidents. And I too hope that we will eventually not need such a mechanism to ensure minority representation. But we are not there yet, and it will take a long time to happen. In climbing towards that ideal state, as we go up, you need guide ropes, you need guardrails to help you get there, to prevent you from falling off along the way. And the reserve election for president is one such guardrail. After the swearing in, I posted a picture on Instagram. Three of us on stage, myself, President Halima, Chief Justice, Sundaresh Menon, one Chinese, one Malay, one Indian, only in Singapore. We had the F1, we had international visitors. One international visitor came from Brazil, Maran. I think he used to be the central banker. And he spontaneously saw the picture, he commented on this. He says, it's most amazing what you have in Singapore. He can't imagine it anywhere else. And in fact, it is. It shows what Singapore is, multiracial, meritocratic, 
one flag, one people. So this is what makes us Singaporean. It's not just a resonant rhetoric, the warm, fuzzy feeling. You can, you can generate that. But we have to live it out daily in little ways and big. You have a neighbor of a different race, you celebrate each other's festivals. Share pineapple tarts, kuidada, muruku. Many reasons to break your diabetes vows. <laughs> but it's much more than that. It's having colleagues and true friends from different races whom we laugh and cry with. And being able to accommodate one another and work through our differences. We have to have that honesty to recognize that our multiracialism is not yet perfect but also that courage and determination to take pragmatic steps to get there, step by step. And that's how we can continue to expand our common space and to strengthen trust and become one people, one nation, one Singapore. Thank you very much.